Good morning, everybody. I want to thank you for joining me today uh, on our newest town hall. And today we're going to be talking about criminal justice reform in Pennsylvania and why it's so important, um, especially now with everything that's going on. And my special guest is Jawood Bay. He is the Pennsylvania grassroots organizer for Reform Alliance. And for those of you who don't know, they've been working a lot in Pennsylvania to help us reform our criminal justice system. And we've made some good strides, but there's a long way to go. And so thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate being here and I appreciate everything that you're doing to help us here in PJ. Thank you, thank you. It's my pleasure, guys, to really be here. And uh, I look forward to working with you guys some more in the future. Um, you want me to get started and kind of jump into what we've been doing and introducing the reform and so forth and so on? Yeah, absolutely. If you could just kind of define or explain what the Reform Alliance is for those people who don't know and, and right. sort of how it got started. And um, right. I know there's a lot of incredibly famous people on the board um, that re were really behind spearheading the effort. So, um, yeah, please go ahead with that. Well, as she said, Again, my name is Dao Bay. Uh, I'm from Philadelphia, um, South Philadelphia, born and raised. Um, I'm currently the Pennsylvania grassroots organizer for Reform Alliance. Reform Alliance is an organization that was started by Meek Mills, Robert Kraft, Jay Z, uh, Ben Jones is our CEO, and a host of other billionaires and celebrities that's you know been passionate about uh, changing some laws and legislation as it relates to criminal justice reform in America. Uh, of course, uh, reform was birthed uh, by the advent of Meek Mills and all of the things that he was going through in the probation system. He was locked up when he was 18 years old. He was on probation until now, until, well, until he was in his 30s. And, you know, it was just an ongoing battle back and forth with probation and the judge and his probation officers and stuff like that. And, you know, um, after he ended up getting the the, the, the two to four for popping a wheelie on a motorbike. Um, once he was able to get out of prison, um, well, even before that, but once he got in, incarcerated to the two to four, I was actually one of the persons that was sitting in the visiting, I mean, in the, uh, in the courthouse when he got the sentence. So it was one thing that kind of really, really motivated me is that when Meek went to go ask the judge if he can ask one question, and she was just so dismissive and so disrespectful. She like, nah, get out of here. And that really broke my heart. So, and I really, as he was about to ask the question, I really didn't want him to ask the question because I knew she had already made a decision. It was nothing he could have said or anything that could have been done at the moment. So, um, but I wanted her to hear his name for the rest of her life, you know? So what I did, I went out and I started the petition uh, we started a petition on change.org. We got over 450,000 signatures probably within like a few weeks. And then, you know, uh, Rock Nation started calling me, all these other organizations, Cut 50, start calling me. And we just start mobilizing and organizing and start doing rallies and protests and stuff like that down at the courthouse until it created a movement. So that spirit, that uh, passion, and that just genuine love for my friend, you know, sparring where we at now uh, as relates to uh, Reform Alliance, it was kicked off a year ago in January. So when it was launched, uh, Van Jones and Meek and them, they quickly hired me as the uh, Pennsylvania grassroots organizer. And we just, our main goal is that we want to get a million people out of prison within five years. So as we sat down and thought about, you know, our lofty, ambitious ideas and dreams to uh, uh, reduce recidivism, uh, one of the easy ways that we thought about going about it was actually attacking the probation and parole uh, system. Uh, in America, we have uh, 6.4 million people that's currently caught up into the criminal justice system. 4.5 million of those people are caught up in the system uh, through the probation and the parole system, and they're constantly going back and forth to prison through technical violations. And technical violations are infractions or 
uh, sanctions that you get for not really committing another crime, but not necessarily, or you, or but mainly just you violating the probation or parole policies that's there. Um, a guy can literally cross the street. Uh, I'm from Philadelphia. You go to Sheltonham Avenue, uh, and if you cross over to go to the mall to the movies, you know you now out of the county of Philadelphia. Well, that can get you sent back to jail for two to four years. Yeah. So we. Mm -hmm. and, and while you're talking, I just want to interrupt a little bit because I want to expand on that and make sure people really understand how powerful these technical violations are um, in terms of sending someone back. Because I think the, the impression is that, hey, if you're on probation or parole and you get sent back, like, that's on you. You, you just right. don't get, He you did know, something you're, wrong. He yeah, you're a bad guy. Yeah. yeah. But that's not the case. Like, you, you guys have a very powerful video on your website that I shared on, on my page about technical violations and how you know, the one gentleman did a U-turn and ended up back in jail for 90 days for a U-turn. And you don't even get a ticket for doing a U-turn here in the States, you know. Um, or if they're late to a, a parole meeting, um, they can get sent back. Or if, if you have one gentleman um, that was on a probationary period in his new job, and so he wasn't able to make the probation appointment with his probation officer and ended up being sent back to jail. So not only do these technical violations have nothing to do with the type of person they are and whether or not they're reforming their lives, but they really impede their progress in turning their lives around. Right, because that, that little small infraction you know, you sending the person back and violating them or preventing them from his job, he loses his house, yeah. he loses custody of his children. You know, there's a whole lot of different things that set back that little three months or 90 days that you think ain't nothing, he can handle it, but he just lost his new apartment. He lost everything that he had, like, you understand? And he lost hope from his family and his kids to believe that they could depend on him and he's going to be around when they need him. So it's, it's, right. it's really, 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 really bad as relates to these technical violations. Yeah, thank you. And I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think it's important to really explain how, um, in my opinion, how ridiculous those things are. You know, you were right. saying you're leaving the county to go to the, to, the, um, to the movie theater, but what if your new job is across the county line, right? And what See, here's, here's the one, well, I'm a returning citizen myself, mm -hmm. right? And I come from the streets. I did a lot of things wrong. And basically, I understand the, the, the culture and the mentality. Most people that, that's, in, that's caught up in the system, we already figured out how to deal with the policies within the system. We already made up in our mind, well, I'm going to be on probation. I know I got to do this. I know I got to do this. I know I got to do that. So, and you know it's a challenge. Yeah. But the biggest thing is the gatekeepers. The, the, the probation officers themselves. Because like you said, it takes just a little bit of intelligence. Here it is, you know the guy's on his probation period at his job. You asking him to come in with, which basically all you gotta do really is check in with him over the telephone, or you could come to his job and it can still be counted as a direct contact and visit from the probation officer. So it's not always just the policies, with the policies is old and dated and bad, but at the same time, like, here's a situation where it just takes good common sense. Right. You understand? You know, uh, I, had, I had met a guy, he was in a car accident. He was in a coma. He had a brace on his neck. He had pictures and photos and videos of him in the hospital. He missed an appointment with his probation officer. They violated him and extended his probation for another year. The man was in a complete coma. And wow. because he missed two visits, you violate him and extends his probation. Yeah. So what we're saying at Reform Alliance is House Bill 1555 and Senate Bill 14 are two companion bills that says, we talking about smart probation, smart probation. We're not saying people is, is, is supposed, it don't supposed to be no, kind of supervision. It don't pose to be prisons or laws and 
people just supposed to be able to run around and do anything that they want to do. No, we saying we anti stupid shit. <laughs> it's just stupid stuff that goes on yeah. that could be avoided. That's you right. Know? Yeah. We got marijuana laws that's outdated. It's legal to smoke marijuana in Pennsylvania, but if you show up dirty at the probation officer, they violate and then sending you back to prison. Right. So certain things not catching up with the other, you know? So it's just things that was maybe once needed that's now outdated. And we need to address those situations now more than ever. I right. believe we have a really good opportunity to, to the bill number, um, someone just asked, is yep. House Bill, is, is really Senate Bill 14. Because to be honest with you guys, we had a lot of issues with House Bill uh, 1555 in the House. And, you know, these probation officers and these legislators and the DA office, they was fighting us tooth and nails and trying to change the bill all the way around. Yes, so Senate Bill 14 and House Bill 1555 are the two bills that we actually pushing as companion bills to change, and, and it has caps within these bills. Like Meek Mills, as you know, he was in prison since he was 18 and all the way to he's 30. We saying that even for uh, uh, felony convictions or felony charge, you shouldn't be able to give a guy probation more than five years. And for misdemeanors, no more than three years. Right. You understand? And if you wanna violate a person, you can't just have the probation officer having all that kind of authority and just violating people based on just whatever they think is is right. Now we saying it got to go through a due process uh, hearing and go back before a judge before you could just send somebody back to prison like that. So it's it's a lot of different incentives in there now to give guys incentives as they come home from prison, they get their GED, they get a college degree, they get some kind of vocational skills. Like, let them off 18 months earlier. Right. Like, these are guys that's proven because we already got scientific proof and data that shows that anybody that's on probation more than three years is going to recidivate. They're going to go back to prison. Yeah. For minor infractions that really doesn't even cost, you know, for a person, just like you said, he, could, he, he, he can't even get a ticket for the infraction, but we send them back to prison or keep them on supervision and cost us $50,000 a year. Right. And that's what I was going to point out. You know, Pennsylvania, um, February of 2019, so just a little over a year ago, was graded an F, the worst possible grade you can get um, for its prison or criminal justice policies. And we right now have a recidivism rate of after one year, almost 43%. And after three years, it jumps up to almost 64%. And so when it, when it costs $43,000 a year to house an inmate in Pennsylvania, and our budget for the criminal system here, our, our criminal justice system, is $2.3 billion with a B, right? That tells you we've got a problem. Because right. if your recidivism rate is so high, then the prison system and the justice system is not doing what it's intended to do. And that's your first red glaring spotlight that says we've got a problem here that needs fixed. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so we did, we have made some progress. Um, let, let me say something about the 43,000. Yep, sure. And, and, and some of the things that we, because messaging is very important. Yep. Uh, Republicans. And, and some of these royal areas in Pennsylvania. That's the conversation we have to have with them because yeah. some people look at things based on the money issue. Right. All we saying, if, the, if we cut this recidivism rate, and you'd be surprised how bad it is in these other royal counties in Pennsylvania, it's even worse. Yeah. You understand? White folks are going to prison at an alarming rate. Is, is, is even worse out there in Central County and uh, 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 out there, Penn State, State. State College area. State College area and all yeah. of those areas. But these was all areas that we went to when we had our, uh, um, uh, our, our campaign for House okay. Bill 1555 and Senate Bill 14. But what we're saying is that if we cut the recidivism rate and get as many people out of this particular system, 
what could we do or where could we reallocate those particular dollars? And each county have a certain amount of money that's going towards the justice system, that's the broken justice system, that if we was to fix it, they can reallocate those funds to whatever that particular county is passionate about or have concerns for. That's right. That's right. And, uh, you know, one thing, you know, I've been really um, passionate about this issue for many, many years. And, you know, when you, when a child has uh, a parent in um, prison, you know, they are, and I'm sorry, I don't have the stat with me. It's like seven times more likely to end up in prison than a child who doesn't have a family member in prison. You know, so if we can cut the recidivism rate, we are, like you said, saving money that could go somewhere else. We're keeping families together. together. We're helping the economy because now we have more workers in the workforce. We're keeping um, children out of prison. Children are now able to be raised in a two-family uh, household, which is more stable and more supportive. I mean, it's like throwing a pebble in a pond and the ripples just continue to go forever. The benefits of, of keeping people out of prison. Um, and so like you said, you know, it affects their ability to have housing. Um, so now we're helping the housing market by keeping people paying their bills. I mean, it's just, it's endless. And, but on the surface, it just seems like such a small thing that's insignificant if it doesn't affect you. Right. And, and again, and, 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 and like we're saying, it's smart probation. And like, just for an example, um, just to pivot a little bit with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, as I was saying, when we first started out, we was pushing uh, two bills, the House Bill of 1555 and Senate Bill 14, but then COVID-19 hit. Right. So we had to pivot. It was so many people. I was getting videos of people in prison. Guys got cell phones in prisons. They snuck cell phones in prisons, and they taking photos and stuff, literally with people dying next to them with no masks on. So we had to, as a criminal justice organization, we had to pivot our position to try to see how many people we can try to get out that wasn't, that doesn't pose a threat to the community. Right. And that's the point that I was leading up to. Everything that we talking about is we trying to look at the people and individuals who don't necessarily pose a threat to the community. We can save money and it's not going to pose a threat to the community. So with COVID-19, like I said, we ended up, we did a great job, I think. Uh, raised $10 million. We, uh, uh, first, we got our first allotment of probably like a million masses that we got sent to the prison. Then we got a donation from the Twitter founder, and they ended up giving us like $10 million. So we ended up getting a bunch of masks, and we've been sending millions and millions of masks throughout the United States to different prisons to just to make sure guys got basic you know, protections. And we put out a, um, a safe plan, a safer plan, for housing inmates while they incarcerated. You know, just basically like trying to get guys sent hand sanitizer with alcohol because these are things that's contraband in prison, but is needed right now. Right. You know, the proper hand, uh, proper cleaning supplies, women with the proper sanita sanitizer materials and stuff. Because when you talk about criminal justice reform and you look at our women in these systems, it's horrible. Yeah. It's super horrible the treatment that you see women go through with just having a baby in prison, yeah. being shackled and having to wear shackles on her legs while she's pregnant, while she's giving the baby, she still had to be handcuffed to a pole. Like, it's just like so many different things that America needs to see and understand and get on the right side of history about. And it's all, all we want to do as a criminal justice reform organization is highlight these stories because we knew, we're a new organization, so we're not uh, posing as if we the end all be all and we know everything about criminal justice reform because we got all these celebrities, we got all this money and stuff like this. No, we understand that we're new and we don't have the credibility. We have more notoriety than we have credibility. So we wanna join and make alliances and build partnerships with people that's on the ground, who's been doing the work for years, who've been passionate about it and see how we can help them 
and elevate their story because we do got celebrities. We do have a big communication department where we can blast off emails or blast off certain stuff and, and get it out to the atmosphere in like record speed time. So like whatever we can do collectively to try to, you know, uh, fix the issues. And, and like right now we talking about Black Lives Matter. We talking about police brutality and fixing the, the broken system with police brutality. So you never know where reform is going to be because we got to be where the issues are. Yeah. You know? And, and it can be, it can be a bit overwhelming, you know, because there are days that I, I look at the news or I look at the Facebook feed and I just think, you know, we are so broken as a society and can we ever get to where we need to be? Sometimes it just seems like there is just too much to be fixed and how are we ever gonna get to it, you know? And trying to make people understand about issues that don't, that don't touch them is really difficult. And but they don't, to... they don't see how it don't touch them though. That's right. That's they don't right. see how it don't touch them. Every last one of us as human beings yeah. is responsible. That's right. If you are a human being, you should have empathy or empathy for others that's in that situation. If you are a mother or, or, or a father and have children or whatever, you're supposed to see other struggle within yourself. Like, you know, you're supposed to see it from within. Like, you don't got you, and everybody's being affected because they're taking your dollars, yes. your tax earned dollars, and spending $43,000, $2.3 billion on foolishness. Yes, that's right. Where if you care about your bottom line and you just a guy that's a businessman and all you care about is your bottom line, well, why, why wouldn't you want your money, your tax dollars to be allocated to, towards something that's more beneficial and more economically justifiable? That's right. And I think that's such an important uh, point to make is that you have to reach people where they are to get them to care about it. And COVID-19 just showed us yeah we all in this shit together man that's right like period yeah nobody was exempt it ain't it ain't it ain't it ain't have no no color barriers no class barriers it ain't have no all of us was ducking all of us scared putting masses on our face yeah you understand all of us had to protect one another yep stand six feet away from one another yeah all of these things was, was, was signs from the creator to show us, you understand, how much we need each other. That's right. The, it's to show us how insignificant some of the stuff that we think is important, how insignificant it was. I haven't thought about LeBron James in 30 straight days. Yeah. Because I was trying to figure out how I'm surviving, how yeah. I'm going to eat. I'm, I live over top of Whole Foods at the time. And the windows at Whole Foods are broken out and being looted. And, my, and because I live over top of Whole Foods, I don't buy a lot of food because I can go right down and get it. But now that has changed. So now I'm in a house, I'm starving. Yeah. I yeah. had to call my neighbor. I had to call my friend. Because we all in this stuff together. I had to leave Center City and go to the hood. Yeah. Where I can find some food at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, I say this a lot. There's a, a quote that really um, touches, touches a chord in me because, you know, I'm a, I'm a government watchdog and so I'm constantly fighting um, for justice and against injustice. And there's a quote, and I don't remember who said it, but it said, you know, they came for the Jews, and I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't do anything. They came for the unionists, and I wasn't a unionist, and I didn't do anything. But then they came for me, and there was nobody left to fight for me. Right. And so that quote to me really speaks to what you were just talking about, is how we're all in this together. And if we don't fight for the injustices against other people, at some point, it's going to come around on us. And there's not going to be anybody there to fight for us. And so it's, it's what we owe our neighbors 
to fight for them because we can. And so That's right. once you know it, you can't unknow it. Not, not just because we can, because we really have a moral obligation. That's right. To eradicate evil. Yep. And you have three ways you can do it. You either eradicate it by removing it with your hands. If that don't work, speak out against it. Mm -hmm. And if that don't work, hate it in your heart. Yep. And that's the least you can do. Right. You understand? It's hate it in your heart. Yeah. But everybody have a, 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 a human, the basic human fundamental responsibility, the basic fundamental responsibility, protect a certain parameter of injustice against all human beings. Yeah. So it's like we, we, it, it's so many lessons. I think I'm telling you though, I'm very, I'm much more optimistic than I was three months ago, to be honest with you. Because I mean, I was going in Pittsburgh, I was going in State College, I was going in um, uh, uh, Luzerne County, and them people don't want to hear this stuff. Right. I was losing faith that we can even get these bills passed. But something happened. There's a yeah. shift. You know, it's a shift. It's a, it's a different type of consciousness that's over the people that I think, and even even just uh, the uh, uh, Harrisburg just opened back. Probably they ain't probably been open a week yet. Right. And you see the difference. You see the difference, you know, and uh, in California, we just got a bill passed over there. I forget the name and the number of the bill. Um, and um, in our t weekly team call meetings, we're starting to pivot back and focus on the advocacy of legislation again. Yeah. COVID-19, we get ready to go back into the green phase. So... It's like we really beginning to start, you know, to really get that focus. So what we're doing is encouraging people to learn. And first of all, follow reformalliance.com. Uh, follow us on um, uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram at Reform. And find out what we're doing. Educate yourself about uh, the bills, criminal justice reform bills, as much as you can. All of the bills. See what bills. That's uh, how it's impacting your particular communities and how you can get involved because is is none of this stuff as I was saying, even though we got notoriety, even though we got celebrities, none of this stuff works without the people that's on the ground. Right. So we we need y'all to bring the information to us to help us, like you know, give us the information real time on the ground information so we could be current with our information so we can execute properly and try to assist as many people or many causes as possible that's relative to criminal justice reform in America. Yeah, and I will put that, um, all the links uh, to your Facebook page, to the um, website in the comments under the video um, mm -hmm. so, that it's, so that it's linked there. But if people wanna get involved, you know, um, whether it's with you or just with the movement in general, what advice do you have to them? How can they personally get involved and make a difference, um, whether it's just by themselves or with a group um, or even joining up with you all? Well, you could join with me because I need help. Because sometimes, like, I need help for my personal, for my job. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I need help. And many is called, but very few are chosen. You know, so it's like, it's, it's not a lot of good help around at times, but don't worry about that. Don't be discouraged from that. As long as your heart is in the right place and you're really sincere about it, you're going to have the stamina that it takes to keep on fighting it, even when it seems like you're in the fight alone. So yeah. I'm always available at Dao Bay, uh D4S, you know, as my Instagram and my Facebook page and my phone number and my email and all that is, is on my pages. You can get directly to me or whatever. Uh, because, like I said, team up with other organizations, volunteer, you know, um, uh, volunteer is, is what this work is really all about. Even though I get a job, I get paid, but it ain't paying my bills. You understand? It's, it's about just having a passion, you know, to really want to affect change. So that's like one of my biggest advice that I give people that want to get into the people business. Um, 
uh, it's Dawood Bay is my is my Facebook page. It's D A W U D and my last name is some reform stuff on there. In this page that's connected to my Instagram. Yeah. So, um, like I was saying, so, uh, Patty, we just gotta just, just, just have people just really care, you know, and, 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 and really like get it as far as just from a human perspective on the importance of really being involved and start really seeing the condition that other people is in and try to figure out if it's criminal justice reform you want to be involved with, there's a lot of work. Is 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 you you'll never not have nothing to do. Yeah. You know, so I'm available. I'm always available. So if you're putting stuff together in your communities or whatever, reach out to me, send me flyers and stuff like that. Remind me that you met me through this particular platform in conversation, you know, uh, uh, and, and try to get at me through Facebook too, because sometimes if you DM me on uh, Instagram, it goes to that other section of your DM, your direct messages. So I'm always available. So let's, let's get involved and let's get to work. So once we get um, the current bills passed, um, SB 14 and House Bill 1555, if that ever gets to an acceptable point, what else is down the road? Like, there's a lot to do with criminal justice reform. It has a lot of pieces, sadly. Um, so what, what other areas are you focusing on or what other areas, you know, we're, we're currently, like you said, moving through police reform. Um, but are there anything out there that some people might not even realize um, are going on that, that really need a light um, shine on them? Uh, Lori, I just accepted you. Um, what I would say, if I had a crystal ball, we getting people out of jail. The bill has been passed, so it's working. It's been effective. Where do they go from here? Yep. We get them out of prison. Where do they go? So, personally, which each one of us can do to build certain things up so we can partner with people like Reform Alliance. So, on a personal level, I'm a developer. I'm a contractor. So, I do houses. So what I want to see happen, and I'm talking to Reform about it, is we got to get prepared for these guys that's coming home. Basically, it would be a re-entry program where we're getting prepared for these guys to come home, and they're going to need housing. They're going to need a job. They're going to need training. It's going to be a various different things that they're going to need to do because it's like we can't get them out of jail and then don't give them the tools that they need so they don't recidivate and go back to jail. Right. So if I had a crystal ball, I mean a crystal ball, I would say we'd be moving to some phases of reentry and trying to figure out how we can really give, because the reason why it's becoming such a noted point to us, because some of the legislators is even saying to our advocacy members that, okay, Jessica, we want to get them out. We want to let people out, but where the hell are they going to go? Yeah. And we have to be able to answer that. Yeah. And, and I think it's important, you know, to kind of circle back because um, you know, when I talk to people about prison reform or criminal justice reform and, and you know, kind of relieving the pressure and getting nonviolent offenders out of jail, we aren't talking about sexual predators. We are not talking about murderers. We are not talking about those types of criminals that pose a threat to society. Right. We are talking about people who are in prison for smoking or having marijuana, or for, like you said, Meek Mills doing a wheelie on his motorcycle. I mean, you know, that's who we're talking about, right? So, um, I'm glad you mentioned that, right? Because one of the reasons why we even had to pivot away from uh, parole, you notice I say is a probation, smart probation, right. not parole. Because all times people on parole could have killed somebody, could have raped someone. And in the state of Pennsylvania, or I believe it was nationally, six people had got out of prison in one month. Six parolees has got out of prison and they killed individuals. Right, I remember. So, right, so our position is we're not saying to let 
just and and in, and in our um uh Senate Bill fourteen and in the new amendments that we made on the bill, which I didn't see it in the last draft of the bill, is they clearly made it clear that this these amendments does not support murderers and uh child predators and rapists. Right. So at the end of the day, we're not saying just let every any and everybody out because mm -hmm. they meet this particular because they on probation. No, if you're on probation and you got a rape case, you got to do all 10 years or however many amount of times that it is, we need to watch you for sure. Right. This guy here that caught that that stole from the convenience store and he stole bread, cheese, and milk. Yeah. To go feed his family, that's not the same guy that gotta be on probation for the rest of his life. Exactly. <laughs> you understand? Yeah. So we saying every crime shouldn't be a life sentence. Right. You know, and I've met this one kid, let me tell you the story. This see, this is the stuff that'll get you involved when you hear the stories. It breaks your heart. Yeah. I met a guy that was 23 years old and had 23 years of probation. What? He was 23 years old and he had 23 years of probation. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. so my, my point, he don't get off of probation until he in his 40s. Yeah. Now we looked at the crime that he did. He had a robbery without a gun. But how does a 23 year old person stays on probation for for 23 years and you think he's going to be able to make it out of the system? That's right. Or he's not going to be emotionally damaged in some way, right? We have a responsibility. <laughs> um, the criminal justice system is supposed to have people better once they come out than when they went in, right? That's the concept. And um, we have to make sure that we're not damaging people emotionally through the process. Oh man, I, I, don't, I don't even know how we make sure that we, ain't no way not to do it. We just gotta give them help after they come through the process. That's ain't right. Ain't no way to, to not damage them. Yeah. Cause the whole process is damaging right. to you. Yeah. You understand? But we gotta keep in mind that these people, even with criminal, with Reform Alliance, when we asking them to relive their stories, it's going back, you taking them back through that dark space again. Yeah. So we got to make sure that they get the help that they need. Right. And the, the answer Lori question in regards to the difference from probation and parole is probation is primary cases where a person got charged, found, got convicted, but the judge didn't sentence them to prison. For whatever reason, the charge may not have required prison time, or the judge may have wanted to be lenient on a person, but once he get probation, it's because he didn't go to prison. Parole is for people who was once sent to prison and did over a year of incarceration in prison, in a state prison. And once they come home, they come home and they be paroled to the parole system. So that's the difference between the probation system and the parole. Both of them are supervision or, or, or programs to supervise returning citizens, but one is for people who actually did state time, did over a year in the state penitentiary, and require a different set of supervision. So that's the reason why we pivoted away from the parole issues, because most of them guys in the state jail may have committed violent crimes, they may have did murders, robberies, whatever the situation may be, and we was getting too much pushback. And we're not saying that we forgetting about those guys, because a lot of those people, a lot of those individuals are being disproportionately sent back to prison as well. But from a, a political and strategic standpoint, you know, with us understanding that we got enemies out there, it behooved us to say, you know what, we're going to enough good stories from parolees coming home, making a transition, doing the right thing, 
and 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 and, and trade all the stories we need to be able to elevate from a parole standpoint in order for us to get back on it. Yeah. And then we have one um, from David. I'm trying to read it. The folks who build prisons lobby our county commissioners and state legislators hard. The fact that there are essentially no limits on gifts to PA legislatures encourages corruption and makes reduced in prison space even more difficult. And he has a point there. Um, you know, it, it's important to not only hold our legislators accountable for the decisions they need, they make, but we have to look at why they're making it. And uh, the lobbyists really do control a lot of the tasks. We have them. <clears throat> I think you're frozen. I, I missed something that you said. Okay. Oh, uh, am I am I frozen? You're there. You go. We I'm got back. You. Yeah, you're back. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Yeah, David was pointing out that um, the prison lobby. Oh, are very I got it. I, I I got my thought on what I was about to say to David in response to that is that I was saying. <clears throat> That's, I was just on a call with a bunch of electives holding the fire to their feet as relates to the communication that they supposed to have with the community. They go and they set up proposals and policies with all electives, all politicians, and there's never enough um, individuals from the community that's involved with the process. Yeah. So I'm encouraging individuals who have a concern to get involved. Yes. Call them up. Talk to them. Like, I don't mind barking on them and letting them know, like, look, don't you do that to our people. And where's, where, who was from the community that was in that meeting? Like, because it's like, you, y'all got, y'all got, sometimes you got to go and kick the door in on these people and let them know that you are a concerned person and you have a right to be at the table. And we need those tables to get younger. We need more women at the table, and we and we definitely need to, to get the tables more more younger to get fresh ideas. Because I was just pissed off on a call that I was just on, you know, and it's coming from old ways of thinking. Right. And yeah. we need our youth in there to come and give us some new fresh ideas. So at the end of the day, I seen somebody say something on here about gerrymandering. I just learned that word when I got involved with um uh criminal justice reform. Yeah, and and just to kind of touch on what you just said, you know, sadly, um, the, the political system in Pennsylvania and really around the country, it's the loudest voice in the room um, that gets heard. And so the only way to counteract all the money that these groups spend in lobbyists is to have regular people like us stand up and have their voices heard and take a stand and say, we demand this and we demand that. That's really the only way we're gonna win over all the money and corruption that's up there in Harrisburg. That's right, that's the only way. Yep. Yep. So. All right, so Brad, do we have any questions uh, on Facebook that we haven't covered through our discussion? We have not. It's been great. Uh, a good couple, but um, uh, this has been a very thorough discussion and, and they've been covered. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so just to recap, um, I'm going to put all of your links in the comment section under our video. And anybody who wants to get involved, you know, please feel free to reach out to either one of us. Um, and just get involved because our system is so incredibly broken and it's not going to fix itself. It's going to take people like us to stand up and demand it. So the more voices. And, and guess what, y'all? And we got them. Yeah. They're vulnerable. We got them. That's right. Like, uh, my favorite movie on The Godfather. Let's hit them while we got the muscle. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> we got them, y'all. That's right. They're finally listening, so don't let your foot off the gas. We've got to get it done, and now right. the perfect time. So, yep. thank you so much for all that you do. I, I just, I appreciate people like you so much on the front lines fighting this fight for people who really can't fight for themselves. 
And um, I just, I appreciate you and thank you so much. And thank you for being with me today and spending your time. I know it's, you're busy and uh, I appreciate you being here. I appreciate being here. And keep me in the loop, y'all. I, I, only way I, I don't know what's going on if y'all don't tell me. You All know, right. So let me know what's going on so we can work together and, and get some stuff done. Yeah. And I'll talk to you about your, 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 your uh, future. What yeah. you doing on the future. Thank you. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's figure out what we can do. Let's do that. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, Laurie. See y'all. Thank y'all. All right. Have a great All day. Right, Bye.